turn with me to the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. This morning we continue our series through the Gospel of John chapters 10 through 15. And we're continuing to answer the question that John is asking and answering, which is, who is Jesus? And this morning we're going to look at verses 15 through 31. That among other things, Jesus is the one who never abandons us. But it feels like that's what he just told them. He just told the twelve, I'm leaving. Now this is after spending three and a half years with them. Three and a half years, Jesus has become a steady presence in their lives, and they've come to not only love this man, but recognize that he is more than a man. He's the Messiah, the Son of God. And then he tells them this heartbreaking news, I am going away, and you're not going to be able to follow me yet. So they're all discouraged, they're upset, they're scared. And Jesus knows it's about to get a whole lot worse for them. So he shares these words with them when they are at their lowest. Knowing that as lonely as they are, their loneliness is only going to grow in the hours that follow. Now, this message is for all of us too, because all of us experience loneliness. As I was sharing with the kids, we, we all have those moments When we're young, when we're old, um, even married people, single people often think, well, when I get married, I won't feel lonely anymore. Um, And then married people laugh at that and think, well, no, it's just worse because then you don't have hope. Um, (laughs) You know, we feel lonely whether we're single, whether we're married, whether we're young or old. It doesn't matter. All of us experience times of intense loneliness. And some of those times we literally are alone. Or are we? The words that Jesus has for the 12 are the same words that you and I need to hear this morning. So if you're able and willing, I'd like to invite you to stand with me in honor of God's word as we read this together. Chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says these words. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live on that day. You will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me... He will obey my teaching. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He does not, he who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. You heard me say I am going away. And I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens. So that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come, let us leave. Let's pray. Father, help us to understand these words and the invitation for us today. 
Father, help us to understand specifically what you're inviting us to do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So Jesus tells his closest friends that he's going away and they're not able to come right away to where he's going. And he has thrown them into confusion and fear. But he's trying to communicate that he has to leave in order for the Father to send the Holy Spirit. So the big idea here is that when Jesus returned to the Father, which for us is past tense, it was future tense for them. When Jesus returned to the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit to take his place. That's why Jesus is saying to them, I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I am going to send another. In fact, look at verse uh, 16, the second verse. Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. Another advocate. Um, The word here translated advocate is translated different ways. Your Bible probably doesn't have advocate. It probably has another word. Um, There's so many different translations for this one Greek word, paraclete. And it's really hard to know how to translate this word. It's been translated helper, comforter, counselor, friend. There are a lot of different ways to translate it, and all of them seem to miss the Greek, which is why it's so hard. It's so hard to translate this particular word. Uh, The NIV used to translate this as counselor. Now they translate it advocate. And here's the bottom line. The word here, paraclete means a friend, especially a legal friend. This is odd. It's not simply a defense attorney, but it's someone who provides help, especially legal help. That's what an advocate is. That's what a paraclete is. But the word is broader than that. So even though it means someone who helps you at trial, it's a bigger word than that, like advocate, that means someone who defends, someone who supports, and someone who encourages. It's a really big word, and it's a really hard word to translate. But notice Jesus says in verse 16, I will ask the Father to send you another advocate. Well, another means they already have one. Well, who's their advocate now? Jesus is the advocate now. And he's still an advocate for us in 1 John. Is there a verse here? There it is. 1 John 2, verse 1. John says this. My dear children, I write this to you. This is after the resurrection and ascension. I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So at this very moment, John describes Jesus as our advocate. He's advocating for us when we sin. He's saying to the Father, you know what? He blew it, and there's no excuse for that. But, you know, I covered that one too. So Jesus is advocating for us in heaven at the right hand of God. But he was also an advocate before he left. He was an advocate to the 12. He was their friend. He was their encourager. He strengthened them. He helped teach them. He helped them understand how to live life, how how to deal with their fears, how to deal with their opponents, how to love one another. Jesus was their advocate in person. Now he's our advocate in heaven. So who's taking his place here? Well, he tells them, I'm going to advocate for you differently now. But I'm going to send another to advocate for you in person. And that's the role of the Holy Spirit. So here's a really, really bad Michael Keaton movie. I'm not sure if any of you have seen this movie. It's called Multiplicity. Anybody seen this movie? I mean, it's a really bad movie. I'm not recommending this movie um, because it's just really bad. But it's funny. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's one of those movies that if you don't take it seriously, it's a good for a laugh, a few laughs. Um, But in this particular movie, uh, Michael Keaton is a construction worker, and he's really busy with his home life, his housework. He's busy with his job, and the demands are so great that when a scientist says, hey, I'd like to clone you, he agrees. Now, he's not cloned as some kind of baby. He's cloned as an adult, you know. So when he makes another one of him, it's the same age. You know, it doesn't scientifically. This movie is just really, really stupid. 
But there's two of him, right? And so he says, you go to work and you do that part and I'll stay home and take care of the home stuff. Well, then that gets too much. And so then he, he duplicates himself again and there's three of him. And then one day he comes and he notices that there's one at home that's not as bright as the others. And he only duplicated himself twice. Now there's three. And he's like, who is, who is this? And they're like, well, we, we were so busy doing your job that we had to have someone to take care of our apartment. And he's like, why is he a little off? And they're like, well, you know how sometimes when you make a copy of a copy, it's not so good? That's what probably happened here. So it's, it's, it's funny, but it's ridiculous. But the whole point is, he feels like I have so much responsibility, I have to make more of me. Well, Jesus says, I'm leaving you, but I'm not going to leave you without another advocate. Now, Jesus isn't going to, to give us a different version of himself that's lower in quality or we experience less intimacy. Jesus is actually going to be replaced by the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. So it turns out there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They didn't realize this. There's, there's three in one, one God in three separate but equal persons. So Jesus says, I am leaving, but I am sending one equal to me in every way who knows you as well as I do and loves you as much as I love you. So the Holy Spirit is going to replace Jesus when he leaves. And for us, that has already happened. So I want you to write this down because this is really important. The Holy Spirit lives within us, so we're never alone. For all of us who follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. He comes to take residence in our lives so that we are never, ever, ever alone. And I don't know about you, but I feel alone a lot. And throughout my life, there have been times where I especially felt alone. And loneliness is a very real emotion, but it should not be mistaken for the reality that we are actually never alone. As followers of Jesus, there has never been a moment, even before we knew Jesus, when we were alone. Hebrews 13, 5, the author of Hebrews is quoting the Old Testament when he says this, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. God says, I will never abandon you. Jesus said it right here in verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now, he may be referring to his resurrection. And in another sense, he's also referring to his return, the second coming. But there's also another way in which God never abandons us, and that is when Jesus left the planet, he sent the Holy Spirit to all those who love and follow him. God will never abandon us as orphans. If we're his children, he will be with us until the end of the age, until we're restored to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in person. You know, as a parent, I would love to say to my kids that I will never, ever leave you. I'll never abandon you. And I've heard parents make that promise. That's not really a good promise. Why is that a bad promise for a parent to make? We can't keep it. Yeah, I mean, I could fall over before this sermon ends. I'd hate that. It'd be really embarrassing for you. But, you know, it could happen. You know, it would mess up your Sunday. But I could die right here before this service is over. I can't, I can't keep myself alive. I, I, I can't change the original color of my hair. I, I, I can't do these things. And so when a parent says to their kid, I will never leave you, that is a promise they cannot keep. But God makes that promise and keeps it because he can. No matter how intensely lonely we may have felt, we have never for one moment in our lives ever been truly alone. I love meeting with people in soul care and walking into the past in times where they were intensely lonely, where they really thought they heard the message. Well, they did hear the message. Nobody's going to take care of me but me. Nobody's going to defend you. Nobody's going to love you. When I was in fifth grade, I really heard the message, no one is ever going to protect your reputation but you. Well, that was a lie. Because at that time in my life, I didn't recognize that Jesus was right there standing with me, loving me, ex experiencing the same disappointment I felt, being angry at the people around me who were mistreating me. That Jesus, in fact, might have been saying things to others and to me, but I didn't hear, and they didn't listen. 
But that doesn't mean Jesus wasn't there. The Holy Spirit has been with me every step of the way throughout my entire life, and I have never been abandoned, not for one moment. And some of the times, I love to meet with people and help them walk into the pain of their stories to realize the narrative they always believed has never been true. They assumed that they were by themselves in that terrible moment. But in reality, the God of heaven was there, perhaps full of rage. Perhaps full of profound disappointment. But the God of heaven has always been with us every moment of our lives. And if we will ask him, he will tell us where he was, how he was feeling, and what he was doing in those moments. So when Jesus says, I'm leaving, he says, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to be with you and to be in you for the rest of of your lives because we are never ever alone well there's two more things jesus says the holy spirit does in this passage but before we cover that we're going to take a brief intermission to feel free to stretch there are drinks back here bathrooms right out these doors to the left we'll be back in three minutes so jesus returned to the father but he made sure he sent the third person of the trinity the holy spirit to take his place so that means number one that we are never alone Because the Holy Spirit lives within those of us who love and follow Jesus. Secondly, though, this passage tells us that the Holy Spirit reminds us of Jesus' words. Which is really important. Because Jesus is leaving and they haven't even understood who he truly is during most of the three and a half years they've been with him. And Jesus has said a lot of stuff. But they don't even understand half of what he said yet. They won't understand it until after the resurrection. In fact, Jesus is saying things right here about, you'll understand this when that day comes. Well, that day is the resurrection. After the resurrection, they're like, ah, I get it now. And then they had to go back and think, wait a minute, what did he tell us? And then they had to remember it all. And then they had to write it down in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, with Jesus being gone, how did they remember what he said? Jesus said, the Holy Spirit's going to remind you of all the stuff that I said. This is a promise from God, from Jesus himself. In Ephesians 1.17, Paul says it this way, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. The Holy Spirit's called the spirit of wisdom and revelation. He reveals the truth about who Jesus is and what he has said. Jesus says this in several, well, verse 17 He's referred to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth, which is interesting, the spirit of truth. Jesus just said, I am the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. He's referred to the God of truth, and now the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And then in verse 26, probably the most important verse in this passage, Jesus says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. He's not going to teach new stuff. You know, early on, we started our church. I had a guy that uh, came up to me and says, I'm going to leave and go to a different church now. I said, why? He goes, I've learned everything I can learn from you. And I'm like, dang. Okay. Wow. That's, I won't take that personally. And he said, I think I've learned everything that you have to offer. I want what somebody else has to offer. And as we talked further, what he basically said is, I feel like you taught me the basics. I need to go deeper. And, and the thing that he was attracted to, it turns out, was a cult. And the cult that he was attracted to was a cult that basically said, we will offer you new things that you never saw before in the Bible. Well, when anyone ever tells you that they have new truth, that's most likely a heresy. Because all truth has been known by Christians for 2,000 years. There's not new truth. But we often think, you know, it's time to go into bigger and better things. No, the bigger and better things is called obedience. There's not more knowledge you need. There's more obedience that you need. And the only difference between you and a more mature version of you is obedience. It's not about knowing more stuff, although that can be helpful. It's about doing what you already know. So the Holy Spirit's not going to give us new stuff, you know, because we're excited to have another Bible study. You know, we're going to get together and learn more stuff. And like, wow, we're going to be so enlightened. No, he's going to remind you of the same stuff you've already heard. That's what he does. He reminds you of what you already know, assuming you know anything, which is kind of important. The Spirit reminds us of truth if we've taken time to reflect on it. So here's the big deal. Scripture represents God's truth hidden, that's to be hidden in your heart so that, 
so that the Holy Spirit can have a language to bring to you when you need to be encouraged or you need to be challenged. The Holy Spirit likes to bring Scripture to your heart, to your mind. But that's hard to do if you haven't reflected on it. And in other words, if you don't know what's in the Bible, it's really hard for the Holy Spirit to remind you of stuff you never knew. So it is really important for, for you and me to spend time reading and reflecting, we call that meditating, on Scripture, hiding it inside of us to give the Holy Spirit a language so that in times of need, he can bring truth to the forefront. And when he does, assuming we take time to, to store it in our hearts, it's like an emergency account. You know, how many of you guys have an emergency savings account? Those of us who've been through Financial Peace University, we're supposed to have one. Does anyone know how, how, many, how much is supposed to be in there? Three to six months of, of expenses. People are like, three to six months of expenses? Yes. Um, <laughs> people are like, oh, you mean three months then? <laughs> At least. An emergency account is supposed to only be used for what? How many of you, and I'm raising my hand, how many of you have dipped into that emergency account for stuff that really wasn't an emergency? I did in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> I'm like, this is sort of like an emergency. I really want those basketball tickets. <laughs> I, I have dipped in there. But the whole point of it is when an emergency comes, you're supposed to have this money sitting there waiting for you. And, and, and if you're like me, you don't like to touch the emergency account because you like to see the interest. You like to, to see that amount in there. You like to see how many, many zeros it has. You, you like that. And when you have to take money out, you look at it and go, oh, it's not what it was. So we don't like to take money out, but the whole reason it exists is so that if we have an emergency, we can take money out. You can only take money out of the emergency account if you have what? Put money in. So an emergency comes and, and there's, no, there's no emergency account. You can't really make a withdrawal because you didn't make any deposits. So here's the deal. The Holy Spirit wants to help you in time of need by reminding you of the things that Jesus said. Therefore, between now and then, you have to do what? Spend time in the Bible. Spend time treasuring up God's truth so that when that moment comes, when you need a word from God, he can bring it to mind. The Holy Spirit reminds us of what Jesus said. He's with us so we're never alone. And the third thing Jesus tells us in this passage, and this is really important, is that the Holy Spirit helps us obey those words. Not just remind us of what Jesus said, that's helpful, but even more helpful is help me actually live it out. Did you catch this theme? Listen to this theme. He, Jesus says the same thing three times. I guess because he knows that like us, they're kind of hard-headed and don't hear him the first time or even the second. So in verse 15, he says, if you love me, you will what? You'll be a fan of me. No. If you love me, you'll listen to my words and they'll be your favorite ones. No. Jesus says, if you love me, you will do what I say. You'll obey my commands. Then he says in verse 21, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. Not the one who says, well, I follow you on Instagram. Hey, I've got your picture as my background screen, Jesus. No, that's a fan, as, as, as uh, Maddie said a, a few months ago. Jesus doesn't want fans. He wants followers. And the difference between a fan and a follower is a fan's like, yeah, Jesus is cool. A follower is, yeah, I do whatever he tells me. He says it again in case they didn't catch it the first two times. In verse 23, Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. Does it feel like he's beating a dead dog yet? It's because they didn't get it. And they're like, why aren't you going to show yourself to the whole world? And he's like, maybe you haven't been listening. If you love me, you will obey me. A lot of people in this room might claim to be lovers of Jesus, but the real test is, well, yes, but do you take time to know what he says and then do it? Is he your boss? Is he the master of your life? If he says it, do you accept it whether you like it or not? Do you do what he says even if it's against every fiber of your being? Do you obey his commands? At the end of the day, that's all that matters. And so then we finally have the Holy Spirit described by something else. So he's referred to as the spirit of truth. He's referred to as the advocate. And then in verse 26, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Finally, he's referred to by the primary way we refer to him throughout the New Testament, and that is the Holy Spirit. Why is he called the Holy Spirit? Well, he is holy because he's God. 
He's God, the third person. He is holy because he's God. But it's important that we know that he's holy because his job is to make us holy. You see, an unclean spirit can live in a non-believer, but an unclean spirit can't live in a believer because we already have the Holy Spirit there, and the clean and the unclean cannot inhabit the same body. If the Holy Spirit lives in you, he is never going to be satisfied with your choices and your thinking until he has purged all of the evil from you, and that will take your entire life. The process of you becoming like Jesus is called sanctification. And the Holy Spirit's job is to make you holy. And the more you cooperate with him, the faster that will happen. And the more you push against the goad, the longer that's going to take. Paul says in Romans 15, God gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles, that is the non-Jews, might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sets us apart and makes us holy, makes us more and more like Jesus so that we become a fragrant offering to God. When God, the Holy Spirit, comes to live within you, he will never be at peace until you imitate Jesus in your character all the time. His desire is to purge all the evil from you and all the idols from your heart and to soften and tenderize your heart so that you love one another, so that you encourage others, so that you take care of the weak, so that you forgive those who wrong you. This is what the Holy Spirit is doing inside of you. This is the hard work that has to be done, and here's why. Because you and I are helpless to be the person we long to be, but the Spirit gives us grace and strength to be holy. Look, I'm called to be holy, and and I stink at it. But the Holy Spirit lives in me, To make me holy. So fortunately, it's not up to me to be holy. If it was, I would never, ever succeed. God asks me to do things I cannot do in the flesh. But I don't have to. Because the Holy Spirit lives in me to do them and to accomplish them through me. There are people in this world that have hurt you so much, it is really hard for you to love them. Would you agree with that? I want you to think about the people in this world right now that have hurt you so much that the idea of loving them is almost laughable to you. And you're like, oh, I'll love them from a distance. I want you to think about all the people in this world that you're like, well, I can't forgive that person for that. Yes, you can. If you let the Holy Spirit do it through you. You see, there's no sense in which we can fail to keep the commands of Jesus if the Holy Spirit lives in us and we learn to depend on him. Let me give you one example. So um, there was a a pastor recently. uh, I was, um, so someone that I I do soul care with asked me if I would speak to a group within their church. And I said, "Uh, sure, I'd love to do that. And so I penciled it in and it was supposed to be, you know, earlier this week. So I penciled in the date and um, about a week and a half, two weeks before I was supposed to speak to this group in this church, the pastor of this church, whose feelings I had hurt recently, um, called me up, and I said, hey, how's it going? And we had some small talk, and then this pastor said to me, um, so I've got you down here uh, to speak to a group in our church on uh, Tuesday, May 2nd. I said, that's right. He goes, yeah, that's not going to happen. I said, what? what? He's like, yeah, I don't trust you, and uh, I'm not going to have you come and speak to our church, so you just need to take that off your calendar. And I said, uh, okay. He's like, you think you could do that? I'm like, yeah, I can not do that. And uh, he's like, good, any questions? And I'm like, no, that was pretty clear. You you were pretty clear. And he goes, okay, have a great day. So I'm like, "Uh, what do I do with that? So I'm like, okay, okay. So um, I want to hurt somebody right now. I'm hurt, and I want to hurt, right? So I'm sitting there thinking about how I feel, and and, and I wanted to do all the things that I talked about several weeks ago. You know, I wanted to find an ally and throw this person under the bus. I wanted revenge. You know, I thought about all the stuff I talked about a few weeks ago, and then I had just given that sermon, actually. So then I remembered the sermon, and I'm like, oh, yeah. Number five, take it to Jesus. I should probably do that one first. So I did that, and I wrestled with Jesus, and finally I realized, you know what, this person's hurt, and they're broken, and they're just trying to... um, punish me because they're hurting. And I've done that. I punish people because I'm hurting. 
I've done that a lot in my life. I totally get that. It's not okay, but I get it. I understand it. Like, I've been there. And I said, God, help me to forgive this person. And I knew that I was going to the Gospel Coalition, Coalition luncheon um, this past week on Wednesday. And I knew this pastor often came to that luncheon. There were about 40 of us that come to that. I knew he often comes. And I'm like, I'm going to have to see this guy who just told me, get the heaven out of here, right? I'm going to see this guy. And I'm like, uh, I do not like him very much. And I think he's being brutally unkind. And then I thought, okay, well, I did hurt his feelings, and I need to ask for forgiveness. So I wrote a card, and I sent it in the mail. And I said, you know, I'm going to see him before he even gets this, and I don't know what to say. And I finally just said, God, help me love this person. Uh, love this person through me, because I don't really like this person. But the truth is, you died for this person. This person is my brother. This person is, is my future friend. Help me to love this person the way you love this person. And so I go to the meeting, and I get there early, and the person's not there, and I'm like, maybe they won't come, but if they do come, how am I going to handle that? So I'm just praying, like, Jesus, help me. Father, just love this person through me because this is like, I don't want to even do this. So then the person walks in, and I see them, and I'm like, uh-oh, they're here. And they look and see me because I'm right in front of them, and they look down immediately, and I'm like, oh, oh they're probably ashamed. Yeah, they probably should be, you yeah. know. And I'm thinking, you know, how am I going to handle this? And so I watched the person, and I just had this, like, tender heart for the person. Like, I just saw them as a child, as just a kid, doing what the kid probably has been doing since they were six, you know? Like, making people pay, which I've done, right? I'm just as bad. And I realized, what do I deserve, Father? I deserve to go to hell. I don't deserve to speak to a group at this church. I don't deserve anything. I deserve to die and go to hell, and you have forgiven me. And what you have forgiven me for, for is far far greater than anything this person has done to me. So I just watched the person walk in and take my eyes off them. And they came all the way up to me because there were a group of pastors here and they shook my hand. And as I shook their hand, I said to their name, let's just say it's John. I said, John, it's good to see you. And I meant it. Like that wasn't even like sarcasm. I mean, if you were standing there, you'd be like, yeah, whatever. But no, I meant it. I meant it. I meant it 100%. Like I meant it was good to see them because it was. Because in that moment, I loved them. And when I touched them, it was almost like magic. It was like Jesus loved them through me. And I, you know what? I was actually glad to see that person. And that is so weird because five minutes earlier, I was hoping, I was praying they wouldn't come. The truth is, I have a really hard time loving some people in this world, and so do you. But I don't have a free pass to not love them. Jesus says, if you love me, you will do what I say. And Jesus says, love your enemies. Forgive those who wound you. Forgive others as much as I have forgiven you. How much is that? How much is that? The Holy Spirit lives in you to make you holy. We never have an excuse to not do the loving thing, ever. And if we're not depending on the Holy Spirit, we have to ask ourselves, do we really love Jesus or do we just talk a good talk? Because if we love Jesus, we'll depend upon the Holy Spirit with all of our might to love one another and to obey his commands. Let's pray. Father, sometimes it's really hard to live the Christian life. We feel intensely lonely. We're hurt. We're wounded. We have legitimate anger and sometimes even rage. But Father, you have called us all to know and do the will of your son, Jesus. And I thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that makes that possible. Father, we ask you now to so fill us with your Holy Spirit that we are empowered to love those that are really, really hard to love, impossible to love without you. Love them through us. Help us to genuinely show tenderness and affection and kindness and patience to the people we struggle with the most because you have shown all those things to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.